Oh, have you clicked on this video expecting to learn something? Well, good news! You're not gonna learn anything, but you can learn something with today's sponsor, Magellan TV. Experience a new type of documentary film experience with Magellan TV and its binge worthy documentaries. That ain't no joke. Updated every week. I didn't even know that. I guess because I'm using it quite newly. I'm like, there's a lot of stuff on here, but apparently new stuff all the time. More on them in a bit. Welcome to Business Plays. I am your boy with the blaze, also known as Simon. What happens here is Danny shall write as a script. This one is a Disney scandal, the dark side of Fantasia. Oh my God, how exciting. I will read it. Sam, our resident memeologist, will add some memes and Let's just jump into it today, shall we? I wonder how many people would consider working for Disney to be their dream job. Doesn't Disney have a bit of a reputation for being a bit shit? Is that just allegedly? Is that just in my mind? Also, a Disney litigious allegedly? Let's just use, uh, let's just uh, sprinkle the allegedly's in there because for safety. Safety first is the motto on Business Place. For example, I know that Walt Disney Resorts are meant to be the most magical place on earth, but I suspect that the magic quite fades quite a bit when you find yourself on the wrong side of the curtain. Maybe some Disney jobs are a bit more peculiar than others. During the late 1990s, some employees at Disneyland Park in California were given an opportunity to put professional boob spotter on their CVs. That's not gonna be what we think of as boobs, is it? I mean, Splash Mountain is a log flume ride which was originally themed around a sequence from the 1956-1946 film Song of the South. Isn't that that famous racist one? Which itself is a whole scandalous can of worms that we'll come back to later. Well, I guess today I'm gonna find out. As the ride takes its final epic downhill sweep, photogra photographs are taken of the thrill-seeking passengers, which are then automatically displayed on... Oh, I see. People are gonna be exposing themselves on this camera, because of course you are. <laughs> Whenever I used to go to theme parks with a friend of mine, we always used to try and look at the camera and like, you know, be as absolutely dead serious as possible. So you're going over this like terrified thing, you're like, ah, and you're like, I love it. Um, and I've actually been on Splash Mountain. It was, a, it was a right laugh, especially all the racism. As the photographs are so, oh yeah, so people are gonna be exposing themselves. Someone's job is gonna be being like, we can't show that one on the preview screens because boobs. So the passengers then automatically displayed a photo on a giant screen afterwards for everyone in the park to see. And if the camera caught you a good side, you might consider buying a prince. The long hydraulic downside to this was first glimpsed in the late 90s when a new trend developed in which female passengers took the opportunity to flash on the splash, resulting in Disney displaying a range of photographs of topless women on their giant video screens. I love it. This led to the creation of a new position at the theme park in which someone was paid every day to sit at a desk and monitor all of the photographs of lady bits before displaying them on the ride screen. Maybe this would have been someone's dream job. It's like, yeah, what do you do? I work at Disney. That's cool. What do you do? I look at boobs. It wasn't destined to be a long-term career plan, though. The position was finally axed in 2009 when Disney exposed the news that inappropriate behaviors from passengers had become increasingly rare. So the professional boob spotters had to get back to dressing up as Goofy. I'd, I'd just pay friends to go to the park. I'd be like, can you expose yourself on Splash Mountain, please? Because I don't wanna, I like sitting at a desk all day and just looking at boobs. But whether you're dressing up in a costume or working in the kitchen, life as an employee at one of Disney's magical theme parks can be pretty tough. You're not actually called an employee. Oh, you're a cast member, aren't you? When you work at Disney, you're a cast member. How exciting. Is that what you do? Oh, I'm a cast member at Disney. If you did, if everyone didn't know that they were called cast members, they'd be like, wow, that's cool. You look famous or something. But it's a shame that the cast members have to try and get by on quite shockingly bad wages. Over the last decade, the average alleged <laughs> over the last decade, the average wage of a cast member has fallen to 75% lower than the national average. Uh, despite the company enjoying an increase in revenue, which helped former CEO Bob Iger take home $65 million in 2018. Good lord, that is a paycheck, son. And dressing up as Mickey Mouse isn't all fun and games. I'm always like, the way to get rich is like to start a business. And it's like, no, 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 it really seems like just run an already existing business, because now CEO wages are insane. And dressing up as Mickey Mouse isn't all fun and games. Up until the year 2001, cast members in costume weren't even allowed to wear their own clean underwear. They had to share underwear, like they were all communists. What? No. Normal underwear was strictly forbidden because under a Mickey Mouse costume, it tends to bunch up and become visible. <laughs> was it really? So cast members were instead issued with Disney jock straps, tights, and cycling shorts, but they weren't allowed to keep their own sets and take them home to sling in the wash. That is wrong. No, they had to hand them in at the end of the day so they could put, th put through Disney's laundry service and you'd randomly be given another set of keeping underwear the next day. I don't care how clean it is. 
I'm not buying someone else's underwear. I'm not wearing someone else's. It's like buying your underwear in like the charity shop. Don't do it. Sadly, Disney's laundry service didn't appear to be very good and employees were regularly handed out dirty and smelly underwear to put on in the morning. That is not right, Disney. That is not right. Dirty mother. It was claimed that Disney didn't even bother to use hot water. I suspect they were using those rubbish crystal wash two by no balls to save on soap. That is an OG Business Blades joke from maybe two weeks ago. Over the course of three years, no less than three cast members caught scabies or pub pubic lice from the shared washed underwear, which is not something you really want to be thinking about when Donald Duck is patting your kids on the head. <laughs> Guys. Guess who the crabs, your pubes we grab. Why not just give them underwear for free, you f***ing Disney? Look, take 50p out of Bob Iger's $65 million paycheck and go to Primark and pick up Primark jock straps and cycling shorts. I don't know. It's not that hard, Disney, is it? Following an intense battle with the union, Disney eventually agreed to assist, assign workers individual garments which could be taken home at night and washed with soap and not water. Also, you're saving money, Disney, because you're not washing it yourself, you cheap f***s. It's like, why? Uh, allegedly. Like, why are we using cold water? Well, it's a bit more expensive to do hot, isn't it? Of course, most big companies have experienced bad days and poor decisions, maybe the odd scandal here and there, but the spotlight does seem to shine a little more harshly on a company built on the foundations of magic and wonder and childhood innocence. Over the course of nearly 100 years, Disney has plenty of time to take the occasional wrong turn, drop a ball, or become embroiled in the kind of downright scandalous baby that would make Snow White blush with shame. Here are a few more moments when everybody got their lice-infested knickers in a twist after some serious shit went down at the mouse house. Two pages. A third of the way through, and the introduction is over. <laughs> Missing in action. I've mentioned before that I'm a big fan of the early Disney classics. The really racist ones. <laughs> I just added that. Uh, but it has to be said that some of the early material can be problematic in today's more enlightened age. And the film, oh, maybe Danny Dutt. <laughs> and the film studio often solves any problems with the most controversial examples of offending material being wiped from existence and pretending that it never happened. I didn't realize until today that although I've seen the 1940s classic Fantasia about a hundred times, I've never seen the uncut version that was originally shown as a theatrical roadshow before moving to movie theaters. I've seen Fantasia. I mean, it was a very long time ago. I was a kid. I always found it a bit spooky. Because, um, like, doesn't that mop get cut into loads of pieces and then there's lo lots of little mini mops? Dude, that, that's scary. It's scary. There are a few minutes of material, which I've heard of this, which can easily be found on YouTube if you want to have a look, which were first trimmed from the film in 1969 and have never been seen on TV or a home media release since. Look, I'm probably going to get a copyright claim if I try and show this, but Sam, let's put it in. I'm going to upload it to YouTube, and if you're watching it now, well, great! I didn't get claimed on it. If you are not watching it now, well, I did. And, uh, well, F you, Disney, allegedly. It's called Fair Use, motherfuckers. Allegedly. The short cut sequences are taken from the Pastoral Symphony, uh, segment, which features a bunch of creatures and, uh, centaurs and centaurettes. Sounds like a centaur with Tourette's. Prancing about and fluttering their eyelashes at each other against the banging Back tune, background tunes of Beethoven. But one little African-American centerette called Sunflower hasn't been seen in the film 50 years, and it's not hard to see why. While all the lighter-skinned centerettes are preening in front of the mirrors and getting ready for the courtship ritual, Sunflower, complete with wildly exaggerated lips and hair, is on the floor scrubbing away at their hooves like a dutiful servant. Disney. This was 1969. <laughs> Do better. She's also the only one who doesn't get to cop off with a bloke center at the end. The interesting thing about Sunflower's removal from the film after 29 years is the way that Disney handled it. When fans of the film began asking what had happened to Sunflower, Disney responded by claiming that she'd never existed and that fans were misremembering early screenings of the film Disney. <laughs> Someone's gonna have a recording of that. It's a trick they were unlikely to get away with today, and clearly back then either. Incidentally, fans were intrigued in the year 2000 by the announcement of the release of the restored uncut version of Fantasia to DVD. DVD, which promised to show every single frame of the original film. Could Disney really be gearing up to revisit the dark side of Fantasia? Spoiler alert, no. I don't know, but I'm gonna say no. <laughs> uh, not quite. They used clever panning and zooming techniques to avoid showing Sunflower hard at work on those hooves. So while this version did technically show every single frame, it didn't always show all of the details of every frame. I have to say that's very clever. <laughs> A couple of frames from another Disney movie have also been missing in action since 1999, and in this case it took the company 22 years to spot the problem. We often hear stories of subliminal messages or saucy images being discreetly planted into family films, and most of the time they're either silly uh, misinterpretations or completely fabricated myths, but unusually in the case of the 1977 animated classic The Rescuers, the story 
is surprisingly true. And just before we get into that surprisingly true story, I'm gonna tell you about a place that has all sorts of true things, because they're called documentaries, and that's today's sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV, what is it? It's a new documentary streaming service. Mm. It's founded by filmmakers, so that's a good thing, because filmmakers kind of know what they're doing when it comes to film, uh, for the love of history. They believe in that old adage about studying history. You can't know where you're going until you've understand where you've been. <laughs> I don't know, I've just been watching loads of documentaries about North Korea, and it's like, never been to North Korea, probably never will, never lived in a communist dictatorship, but I know where I'm going. Communist dictator, not really, not really. Uh, there are loads of documents. There's one, uh, it's like, fun times in North Korea. Shit, I probably remember what it's called. It's really good. Hang on. Yeah, it's called Have Fun in Pyongyang, North Korea. And it's just a really solid documentary about North Korea. And then I watched one about Kim Jong-un and like <laughs> his uh, un definitely, definitely unauthorized biography. It's very good. Magellan TV is one of the richest catalogs of history content available pretty much anywhere today. Everything from the Greeks to the Great War, plus modern history, biographies, scientific profiles, true crime, and so much more. Lots of stuff about North Korea. I don't know what it is about North Korea, but I'm always like, just can't get enough of that. I find it wildly interesting. <laughs> it's just so different. Um, their team of producers and content developers look all over the world for new documentaries and add to their library, updating it every single week. I've not actually watched anything foreign on there yet, but I guess I will at some point. Uh, to be honest, it's like, <laughs> subtitles are fine, and I'll like happily read subtitles because, you know, I like to pretend I'm cultured. But, you know, there's lots of stuff in English which I'll probably go through first. The end product is like Netflix if it was designed by your favorite history professor. That's pretty, that's, that's a good description. That's better than, you know, my description. I should just stick to the talking points. And what's the one thing you love about streaming services? No goddamn ads! <laughs> the irony. It is not lost on me. Um, and you won't find any on Magellan TV because there's nothing worse then when that thing you're trying to watch gets interrupted by ads. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, if you're looking for 4K explorations of binge-worthy topics, you should consider Magellan TV. I just finished, oh wait, this is where I'm supposed to make my <laughs> When I do this read for the other channels, that's where I make my recommendation, which is, because I just riff off the, the talking points in business plays. Go check that Korean stuff out, North Korean stuff. You can get one month for free by clicking the link in the description below. Go do it, it's worthwhile. You'll, you'll do that month. And you'll be like, yeah, that was pretty good, I'll pay for it. Which would be great because it supports the show. Let's get back to the video. <laughs> <laughs> During a sequence in which uh, we're talking about the rescuers, I don't know why I decided, like, <laughs> honestly, because I don't want to read the scripts before I do it, but I have to find a place to insert the ads. And it seemed like this was a good place. Turns out apparently not. We were talking about the rescuers and some imagery getting stitched into it somehow. During a sequence in which the two secret agent mice are flying through New York on the back of a talking albatross, I guess you had to be there, an unexpected image pops up in an apartment window in the background. It's actually a photograph of a topless woman. The kind of filth you'd only expect to see on the ride screen at Splash Mouth. <laughs> now it's worth pointing out that you wouldn't be able to spot this during a normal viewing of the film that runs at 24 frames per second. And this might explain why Disney themselves didn't notice it until the 1999 release of the film on VHS. Just three days after the release, Disney, Disney made a public statement on the matter and promptly recalled all 3.4 million copies of the film. Now, whoever did this, if they find out, is getting in trouble. However, this wasn't quick enough to save the 2.2 million viewers who died from shock while watching the uncut version. No, I made that last bit up to try and please Simon. We know how much he appreciates a high death count from dodgy product recalls. Oh, OG business plays sprinkles with OG references. The real mystery is in who planted the image in the first place. Disney claims that it wasn't inserted by any of their own animators, and it must have occurred during the post-production process. The frames have naturally been removed from all subsequent releases and showings of the rescuers, but some have claimed that Disney was just making a mountain out of a molehill anyway. If they hadn't drawn attention to it and recalled all those VHS tapes, it's possible that nobody would have ever noticed. Well, someone obviously did notice, didn't they? Because they wrote in and were like, Disney, what the f*** is this? I really have to look this up right now. What was it called? The Rescuers Nude. Oh god, am I gonna get pictures, like, fan pictures of the Rescuers Nude? Let's hope not. I don't want to see naked mice. Oh, wow. That really is in there. That's f***ing great. I love it. And it's not even like a cartoon photo. It's like a photograph. 
That's fantastic. Of course, it would have been impossible not to notice the on that was probably Disney's most controversial film ever, the 90, oh, we're moving on, the 1946 film, live action musical, an animated sequence, the sequences that was Song of the South. The idea of adapting the 1881 collection of Uncle Remus stories was never a particularly wise one in the first place, considering that these black American folktales were adapted by the white American writer Joel Chandler Harris, who thoughtfully came up with his own dialect and interpretations of the language. That sounds appropriate. Uh, the film follows the post-Civil War years of America's Deep South and depicts just how utterly wonderful it was to be a black plantation worker at the time, toiling away for your white bosses while occasionally getting a chance to sing jolly songs with cartoon animals. I mean, yeah, that's definitely the past I've heard about. Being fantastic time to work on a plantation. Brilliant. Not really. It's often wrongly claimed that the film glorifies slavery, but it is in fact set after the abolition of slavery. The main problem seems to be that the black plantation workers are still very much subservient to their former white masters and seem very happy with their lot, despite the fact that they're living in poverty in comparison to the clever rich white people. It's hard for me to make informed judgment because I'm, it's the only Disney film that I've never had the opportunity to watch. I've also never seen Song of the South, at least as far as I can remember. However, we brought this up on a previous video and someone was like, that song, zippity doo da, zippity a, that is from Song of the South, and I definitely remember that as a kid because I had like a CD of Disney songs, or like a tape or whatever, and I definitely knew that one, and I liked it. For some reason, I always thought it was from Lion King when it's obviously not. <laughs> Disney seems very keen to wipe any memory of the film from the archives. It's never been released on any home media format in the US, and it is one of the very few films available, not available to watch on the Disney Plus channel. Some film critics defend Song of the South as a product of its time, and it's certainly worth bearing in mind that when it was originally released, white and black people weren't even allowed to sit together in the same movie theater. But it's also worth, rem worth remembering that the film attracted strong criticism, protests, and picket lines even back in 1946. A congressman from Harlem described the film as as an insult to American minorities and everything that America as a whole stands for. Even while Disney himself had reportedly expressed grave misgivings about the tone of the film, but had decided to release it anyway once it was in the can. Dirty mother. But there are also calls in some quarters for the film to be brought out again from the vault so that it can be viewed in historical context. In much the same way that it's okay to show the racially problematic Gone with the Wind, as long as it comes with a warning at the beginning which explains that everybody in the olden days was a racist. American legend. Whoopi Goldberg has expressed a desire for the film to be released again so that it can ignite a conversation about what it was and where it came from. It's interesting to note that outside of the US, the Song of the South ban seems to be relatively recent. Although it's unlikely to be shown or released anywhere today, it was actually released on VHS and Laserdisc in Europe and Asia as late as the 1990s and was apparently even screened on BBC as acceptable daytime entertainment as late as 2006. However, it's hard to imagine the film ever seeing the light of day again in the near future. The main problem is that it's a Disney film, and Disney are in the business of dishing up wholesome family into Entertainment. They're not going to spend time and resources on marketing the release of a new of an old film, which can only ever be presented in the way that makes it clear that the content is inherently wrong. Yeah, I mean, I can't blame Disney for this one. It's like, okay, this was a part of your past, and yes, it can ignite a conversation and all of this stuff, but it's like, it's not really what Disney does. And it's not really what Disney has to do. The reality is people are still gonna buy Disney Plus and go to Disney World and do all that other Disney shit. I mean, Disney is like, Allegedly, I mean, I've heard it described by other people as kind of like this monolithic mega corporation that just gobbles up creativity. Uh, allegedly. And it's like, you know, people still love it. They still let you make great shows. Although Disney now seem embarrassed about the film, they seem happy enough to theme the Splash Mountain ride around it for the best part of 30 years. It wasn't until 2020 that Disney eventually decided to announce that the theme of the ride was soon going to be reimagined around the Princess and the Frog film. Still, I'm not entirely sure if Song of the South should be considered Disney's worst cinematic events. At least it didn't shove any lemmings off a cliff making this one. Are we about to talk about that? No. <laughs> uh, then that is a reference to an original. Uh, an older business place video. Not cool for the kids. It had never really occurred to me before that copyright laws can even extend to gravestones. I've always hoped that I could have the Enron logo displayed on my own gravestone, but this apparently could be trickier than I imagined. And the parents of a four-year-old Spider-Man fan from Maidstone, Kent, <laughs> coincidence, that's where I'm from, uh, in England, who tragically died in 2019, were soon to discover that Disney are not always so keen on the idea of granting wishes and sharing the magic. Young Ollie Jones was utterly devoted to Spider-Man during his short life, and one of his most cherished moments had been the time he got to meet his hero at Disneyland. After Ollie died from a rare genetic disorder called leukodystrophy, Leukodystrophy. His devastated parents ensured that he was given a superhero-themed funeral, and plans were drawn up for his gravestone, which would feature an engraving of the world's most famous web slinger. Please, Disney, don't do this. 
I know you're gonna do this because this is what this video is about, but please don't. It's not right, Disney. The Vermeer had put up a temporary plastic marker on the spot which featured the design that was intended to be engraved on the finished gravestone. But they were quickly ordered by Maidstone Council to remove the plastic marker until permission could be obtained from the owners of the Spider-Man copyrights. This, of course, being Disney, who bought Marvel Entertainment in 2009. Of course, everyone knows that. Simon. Everyone. And sadly, this permission was not forthcoming. The company claims that it was Walt Disney himself who had originally created a policy which banned the use of the company's characters appearing on headstones, cremation urns, or memorial markers. And despite an online petition receiving over 150,000 signatures, Disney never budged, declaring that it was trying to preserve the innocence and magic of its characters, even if the character in question was pushing 60 years old and had only relatively recently been acquired by Disney. Maybe Maidstone Council deserves a portion of the blame here for flagging it up in the first place when it would probably have gone unnoticed by the Disney Empire. But a massive thumbs down to Disney for prioritizing an ancient and irreverent rule over the wishes of bereaved parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's not really as if they were being consistent. At around the same time, they granted permission for a young fan who had died of cancer to have an engraving of Iron Man on his headstone. To this day, they've never really bothered to explain why they couldn't have just done the same thing for Ollie Jones. <laughs> they just didn't like Ollie. Harsh. On a similar note, Disney scored a massive open goal when they got heavy with three children's care centers in Hallandale, Florida in 1989. The daycare centers had innocently decided to brighten up the interior a bit with giant colorful murals depicting five foot high painted figures of Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Goofy, and other intellectual properties belonging to Disney. As soon as they heard about it, Disney ordered all three daycare centers to take down the murals immediately or face going to court. Disney, allegedly, dick move. Allegedly. Not wishing to get involved in a legal battle with one of the biggest companies in the world. <laughs> yeah, well, right there along with you. All three cast centers swiftly agreed to get rid of the offending murals. But that's when Universal arrived on the scene to save the day. The arch enemies of Disney had recently launched their first theme park in Orlando, then, and they sniffed an opportunity to grab some positive promotion for themselves while painting Disney as the villains of this piece. Yeah, because they were, allegedly. Uh, in, junction, in conjunction with Hanna Barbera, who owns the cartoons upon which many of the new theme parks rides were based, Universal publicly announced that it was giving free permission for the three troubled daycare centers to create new giant murals based on the likes of Scooby-Doo, Yogi Bear, the Jetsons, and the Flintstones. Epic. And not only that, when the murals were complete, Universal and Hanna-Barbera threw a lavish unveiling ceremony in which children and parents were invited to mingle with dozens of their favorite costumed characters, attracting massive publicity for the new theme park while putting a smile on the face of the kids. Win, win, win. Oh, Disney own goal. Everyone's a winner. Danny and I, same page, apart from Disney. <laughs> Maybe their professional boob spotter was off sick that day. Yeah, they made her booby. Uh, and the best bit about all of this mingling with the likes of Scooby-Doo and Yogi Bear rather than the tiny, dirty, tramp Mickey Mouse is that they're far less likely to have scabies or pu uh, pubic lice. But I'm a boom This has been Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze. This video was brought to you by Magellan TV. Thank you, Magellan. Your North Korea documentaries. I'm going to watch one with my lunch today. Thank you for the sponsorship. Thank you for watching. Uh, get some merch, purchasethemerch.co, and I'll see you next time. Disorder called leukodystrophy. Dis, dis, leukodystrophy. Leukodystrophy.